Okay, Matthew chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22 this morning. Um, And we're going to talk about discipleship and the cost of discipleship. I don't know if you've ever heard someone say this, I will follow Jesus wherever he goes. But, but, or if, right? If he asked me to go to Africa, I don't think I would go. If, if he asked me to do this, I don't think I would do it. There's always an if at the end of that sentence or statement, right? I will follow Jesus wherever he wants me to go, but I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. It's kind of like marriage vows today. They are so unstable. They're not on solid ground. Marriage vows today, if you were to get married in a secular world, there are no vows there at all. At all. It's all about uh, what they're going to do for you, not what you're going to do for them. The old marriage vows are are gone and dead. The, The I will be with you until death do us part. Throw that one out the window. You know, I will be with you through rich and poor. Throw that one out the window. No, if you become poor, I'm out of here. Through good, through bad, through emotional stresses, through sickness, through health and so forth. Throw those out the windows. Vows are no longer kept in our society today. That's why the divorce rate is so high. As soon as a little problem comes into the marriage, boom, I'm out of here. I don't need this. I'll find someone else or I'm better off living on my own. And so there's no commitment to the cost of marriage, the cost of discipleship. And I kind of liken the two together. They really are alike, aren't they? Because our discipleship with Jesus Christ cost us something, just like in marriage cost us something. In marriage, you become one. You are no longer separate from one another. You become one unit together, and you are to sacrifice your thoughts, your ways, your ideas for the other person. And that's a, that takes a lot of work. That's really hard to do. And it's effort that, that takes a long time. And, and so marriage will only grow when both individuals begin to surrender to one another. And then that marriage will begin to flourish as they keep their vows. Jesus, in a sense, is our groom and we are the bride he says and so we are committed to him just as much as he is committed to us and so he will stay with us thick or thin through health or unhealth with riches or poverty god never leaves us or forsakes us he always performs what he said he'll do it's us who do not perform what we will do and again like the marriage vow it's too difficult to be with you lord there's a cost that costs me too much it's too difficult to deal with people, you know, in your church. And so I don't want to go to church. It's too difficult to be a part of a Thanksgiving reach because it cuts into my time. It's too diff, you know, and, and we go on and on and on and on. And in reality, God says, I'm here with you no matter what. And even if it's too difficult with you, I will be by your side. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And if you need time off, then I'll give you time off. But I'll be there by your side because he's committed to us 100%. And that's what disciples do they commit themselves a hundred percent to the lord they're married to the lord and that does not change at all whether even if we ourselves change and so as we look at these few verses here we see a short transition where jesus is going from capernaum and he's going down to gardenius where where we will see peter um, uh, dealing with the man in the tomb there and we'll see that next week uh, Jesus has been in Capernaum. He's been ministering. It's his station, uh, his home, uh, where his mother-in-law was healed. Many were healed. Demon-possessed were, were, were um, delivered from all of that. And now all of a sudden Jesus is moving out from Capernaum to Guardians. And a situation happens there. And at that point in, in, in Jesus' walk, which probably happened many times, he talks a little bit and takes the opportunity to talk about discipleship. And we should know that Jesus had many disciples he had many disciples let's turn real quick to john chapter 60 i want you to understand the the context here so i'm building the foundation and then we'll get into the the scripture here so john chapter 6 we know that jesus had many disciples but not many were disciples there was a situation in john chapter 6 let's see And we can probably just really quickly look at 53. It says, Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, unless you eat my flesh, 
eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days. Now, Jesus said this, and he has 120 disciples at this point. They're following him. They're listening to him. They're learning from him. They're worshiping him. They're studying him. They're watching him. Every word he says, their ears are hearing. And all of a sudden, he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And that just stumped them. As it stumped me when I first read that, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And your first idea is what? Cannibalism? What is he saying? Literally eat my flesh, drink my blood? Well, he clarifies it and he talks about it in verse 60. Therefore, many of the disciples, when they heard this, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And then Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured about this. He said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So he clarifies that these are not literal words. He's speaking spiritually to them. He's saying, unless you give me your all, unless you are consumed by my body, consumed by my blood, consumed by my presence, unless I am your everything, you'll have nothing to do with me. And it was too hard. And it's a spiritual saying. It's talking about walking. When God created Adam and Eve, what did they do? They walked with God. They walked with God. God loves walking with us. And so they walked with God. And I'm sure they asked him a lot of questions. I'm sure that God ministered to them as they were holding hands in the garden. But they sinned. And they broke that fellowship. Who sinned? Man sinned. God didn't sin. God didn't break the fellowship. God was still committed, and he provided a way through his son, Jesus Christ. When God called Abraham, he went to Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I want you to leave the land. God was with Abraham. He gave him a command. Abraham followed him all the way to the land of Canaan. God wanted a relationship with Abraham. When God went to Jacob, and he began to what? Wrestle with him. But he wrestled with him to humble him and to turn him to a great nation as he promised Abraham. As he wrestled with him, he touched his hip and he became crippled so that he would no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, ruled by God. God loves hanging around people. God loves to be with Abraham. God loved to be with Jacob. God loved to be with David and give him songs of worship and praise and adoration. And then God all of a sudden shows up. How? through the birth of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ now walks among us. He loved to walk among men. And so he loves disciples, and he gathered men around him, and he poured into them sayings that they would not understand. But if they would embrace and trust and commit and surrender, they would eventually see what Jesus was talking about. But many left. Out of the 120, when you really think about it, how many were left at the cross? Twelve disciples. But only a few were at the cross. John was the only one. Several women were there, the Roman soldiers. He died alone, basically. See, discipleship costs, and it cost us something. So Jesus had many disciples, and, but yet many disciples fell away. Many disciples could no longer endure it. I see that in the church. In the 20 years that I've been teaching, I see it come and go throughout the church. Men who, who come in, women who come in, uh, and they're excited, uh, they love the word, uh, and they'll tell me, you know, uh, a good word, that was a wonderful word, I love your teaching, I, I love the church, I love the, the love that's here, and then in a matter of time, when something happens, I don't like it here, I don't like the teaching, I'm out of here, because they don't like something that happened. That's not discipleship. That's not true discipleship. They don't understand the cost of what it costs to maintain and keep a relationship with someone. And so they're always going from one place to another. And some of them I've kept track, and they're still going around from one place to another. That's just the way their life is. Because they're not willing to finally sit down and say, what is the cost of discipleship? How do I become a disciple of Jesus Christ? How do I become a disciple within the part of the body of Christ that he has me in? Because all of that costs us something. And so Jesus shows us within these few uh, words here what that cost is. Because discipleship is like a marriage. So let's go ahead and read 18 through 22. 
says, And when Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then others of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now let's look at a couple of things before we get started here. Just look at the scriptures here in its context. Jesus is leaving Capernaum. He's going to the Gardenian area. Uh, he's passing this hilly Capernaum place uh, by the Sea of Galilee, very rocky. I stood right at those shores. And, and you look over to the left and you can see the direction that he's headed to. He encounters these two individuals. Basically, he encounters a multitude, he encounters a scribe, and he encounters a disciple. And so the multitude are all around him, probably seeking him for the wrong reasons, hearing his words, seeing the miracles he's done, they can feed, be fed by him. And so they're following him. He's getting away from them. A scribe comes, a religious leader comes and asks him a question. And then we also see a disciple of his among his own disciples asking also a question we see that jesus is mentioned here three times which i find interesting because jesus deals with the multitude jesus deals with the scribe and jesus still deals with the disciple here and you notice that he departed he left that area to get away from the multitude so that he could spend time preaching the gospel to those who would hear and he also as he's leaving he's saying follow me there's discipleship right there I want you to follow me, follow after me, but I want you to know there's a cost to following me because foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have nothing basically to offer you, but you should follow me and let the dead bury the dead. And he says that twice here in the context, twice he says follow, and then in verse 22, follow me again. So we see the context here, we see two men who talk about following Jesus and the cost that it is to follow Jesus. Now let me share with you another uh, passage back in Matthew chapter 5 verse 12. Uh, it says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if its salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, he says that we as disciples should rejoice, that we should be exceedingly glad because great is our reward in heaven. So what's the positive aspect of, of the cost of discipleship is that we have an eternal state. Uh, we have a joy that surpasses anything else under persecution, under cost, under servants to the Lord. It's a joy that surpasses all understanding. And, and we should be exceedingly glad that we get to participate in the kingdom of God. That is such an awesome thing to realize when we realize there's a kingdom. See, our kingdom has a king who served us. Our kingdom is a kingdom where we should then serve him. And we serve him by serving one another in that kingdom. And we get to participate in that kingdom. There is another kingdom, but that kingdom is leading to death and, and brought it as its way. And that's a kingdom that serves itself and looks at itself what it can get, what it can grab, what it deserves, what is mine, what should be, and I don't like, and I don't this, and I don't that. What's the middle letter in sin? I, I, I. That's sin, and it leads to destruction. But God's kingdom leads to service, and we should rejoice that we're in that kingdom. Are you glad you're in the kingdom of God? I'm glad I'm in the kingdom of God. Thank God that I get to serve him in great ways. We met this uh, young man named Peter at the, our, our treat, retreat he was our server and, and every time they came to service we're so glad to serve you if if there's anything you need just let us know we're here to serve you serve you serve you serve you and it was just like wow this is pretty neat young little young little man probably 19 to 20 years old and, and then finally uh pastor dennis said hey peter so what's your story what's going on and so we started talking with Peter, and he's, I just want to do great things for God. I just want to have great faith in God. I want to just trust him and for, for the untrustable things, you know, and so forth. So we were ministering to him, and the Lord kind of gave me a word for him. Um, Thomas was mentioned. 
and, and how Thomas believed because he saw. And what did Jesus say, Thomas? You believe because you see, but blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. And I told Peter, Peter, you've already done greater things than, than, than Thomas because you haven't seen and yet you believe. And Jesus said, blessed are you, blessed are you. And he's like, wow, I didn't think of that. Blessed are us because we don't see the things the apostles saw, the 120 disciples saw, but yet we believe and we work in the kingdom of God. That's an awesome thing. <clears throat> in Luke 9, 62, Jesus said to, to him, no one has put his hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Yes, it costs us something. It will always cost us to follow Jesus. So the multitude followed Jesus. And Jesus gave a command to go to the other side. And probably because the multitude um, really were seeking after Jesus for other reasons. Uh, there are other reasons to seek Jesus. Uh, one, uh, I need a healing. You know, I'm sick. Um, I need financial help. Um, I, I, I need, uh, and again, it's all about what I need and not what I can give. And so that's what the multitude was all about. And so Jesus said, no, we need to cross to the other side. I need to go forward. I need to continue to preach the gospel message. I, I can't stop. Uh, I have a plan and, and a destiny, and it's the cross, and so I need to keep going forward. And then this certain scribe, this writer, uh, as they're described as a secretary probably, one who knows the word of God, knows uh, how to write. At that time, a lot of people didn't write. And so it was, it, it was very refreshing to hear Jesus coming to them and explaining everything to them. And not just depending upon the religious leaders to tell them what it means uh, to worship God. And Jesus was very clear. And so his words were profound to them as they were listening to him. But this educated man, this man who knew how to write and has probably written many a scriptures uh, down, comes to Jesus uh, expecting uh, to possibly follow him. And it just seems that not all religious leaders were against Jesus. Not all religious leaders hated Jesus. They saw something in him, in his words, and what he was saying. They saw the truth. God was ministering to their spirits. And he, so he came and said, Teacher, I will follow you. I will follow you wherever you go. And it indicates a readiness, a desire, a hunger to follow after Jesus. We don't know if he followed Jesus. It doesn't say. But he definitely wanted to follow Jesus. And so it speaks here of his commitment to Jesus. I wonder if he knew uh, what Jesus' uh, journey really consisted of. I wonder if he knew that eventually it would lead to the cross and death for him and persecution for the disciples. I mean, how far was he willing to go and follow Jesus? Maybe partway. Because if it got too difficult, then I can just turn back from following him. I read a story that says, too often we're like a young man who pours out his heart, devoted uh, in a letter to his girlfriend of his dreams. And he writes, darling, I would climb the highest mountain and swim the widest streams, cross the burning desert, die at the stakes for you. And then he writes, P.S., I'll see you Saturday if it doesn't rain. You know, we, we say all these things, what we'll do, what we'll do, but they're just words, words that really have no backing, no meaning, no truth to it at all or power because they're, they're just words. They sound good. They sound good. I used to have a boss that would tell us all the time, I love you, I love you. And we're like, okay, so you love us. <laughs> you know, you keep telling us that. And then eventually at the end, it was during the deregulation of the company, he ended up splitting off and taking all our equipment and plans and starting his own little business. That's how much he loved us. You know, so just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, doesn't mean that a person loves you. You know, showing it, uh, the action, the evidence behind it. We love you here. We really do. That's why I teach the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so you get God's counsel, not mine. You get to hear what he's saying, not what I'm saying. I want you to be the most well-fed people by giving you every word. And boy, there are times I give you every word and, and what it's saying. That's how much we love you. We love you here to work with you, to be patient to equip you for the work here, to invite you to participate in the kingdom of God. Not because we need help, 
and we're trying to build our kingdom. No, because you need to be a part of God's kingdom, and we're inviting you to be a part of God's kingdom. And that's love. We're not keeping you outside of it. We're trying to draw you into it. We're trying to get you to understand that there's a kingdom where God is working. And yet we understand that there's a kingdom outside of that that you're in and living among. And it's difficult and it's hard. So we're here. We love you enough to hear you, to minister to you, to understand that. So that we can encourage you and strengthen you and build you up and give you the tools that you need to battle against those things through truth. That's how much we love you. Uh, we love you enough to say goodbye and then to say hello when you come back for whatever reasons. Because it's not about being offended. It's about what God is doing in your life and what He wants to do. And He may offend you in various ways, but He's working a work in you. And when you get it, you come back and we're open arms because we love you. It's what true discipleship is all about. We should be in it all the way, all the way. George Whitfield said this. He was a great evangelist in the 1800s. He said, I am now about to take orders and my degree and go into the world. What will become of me? I know not. All I can say is, I look for perpetual conflicts and struggles in that life and hope for no other peace but only a cross Well, on this side of eternity. He understood the cost. He understood the cost. Christ is asking you to follow him. And there's a cost to follow him. I think of the greatest cost that I had in following him when I think about cost Oh, it, it cost me a lot of friends, but I didn't care for them that much anyway. It, it, it's cost me family, and I love them, but I know God's working. It, it's cost me other things, but I think the greatest cost, at least from my perspective, is it cost me my job. I had such a neat job. I had such a secure job. I had a retirement that would have kept me in Virginia going and traveling. You know, well, she can't travel, but... You know, doing whatever. You know, I know guys that had, had by the time I had quit or retired from Edison to to do this full time, they already had a million dollars in their stock options and so forth. And that was ten years ago. So I'm sure they have several million. I was just talking to another guy, and he was saying that he's got five million just in his stock options and things like that. That's how much those utility company guys get. That's what you're paying for. So, for me. That was a cost, a cost that would affect Virginia and I for the rest of our lives. But that was a cost that we were both happy to make because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to just be used by him in whatever way and as difficult as it is. And that was a cost that we both were willing to make. And God had laid upon our hearts. And I could remember the day that I came to her and she already knew the Lord's already spoken to me. You're quitting your job. And I did. Because I want to be used of God more than ever before today than even yesterday. Where would you be without the Lord? We have to ask us, where would you be without the Lord right now? What would you be doing? <clears throat> Jesus said, look, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. I've got nowhere to lay my head. Nowhere. And, and yet, it's, it, it's the birds of the air that the Lord feeds on a daily basis and takes care of their needs, right? And so Jesus is saying, look, I have nothing but what I do have, and that is my Father who watches over and takes care of me. He'll take care of you also, if you just trust. Because Jesus didn't have a lavish life, didn't have a home like Peter had a home, and was able to keep his mother-in-law in, you know, didn't have a residence upon this place at all whatsoever. And so the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head and so he speaks to another disciple, and this other disciple comes and says to him, let me first go and bury my father. Now, there could be two meanings here, and just rather quickly, I want to share with you those two meanings. One could be that his father literally died. I, I need to go and bury my father. And, and because I need to go and bury my father, there are certain rules and regulations that I need to follow. You know, a priest couldn't go and touch his father's dead body, then he's defiled. 
He's defiled for so uh, a certain length of time. So he can't come and follow you now. There's a bunch of uh, rites and rituals that he has to go and perform. And so it could be that he's saying, my dad just died. I need to go. I need to mourn. I, there's a certain prescription I have to prescribe. So it may be a month before I come and follow you. That could be possibly what he's saying here. Or it could be, and there might be some evidence of this because there is another uh, another scripture that, that talks about uh, uh, a similar situation uh, about this. In Luke 9, 61, another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So it could be that, um, that this man was telling Jesus that, you know, they're still alive. Uh, I have a home with them, I have responsibilities, I've got bills, I've got this, I've got that, and so I need to go home first, say goodbye, let me set things up, let me pay off some bills, let me you know, just get things in order, and then I will come and follow you. We're not sure um, which one is true. I don't think it matters. Jesus is calling you to come, and so you have a choice to come. And so Jesus says, follow me. And that word follow means keep following me, don't stop. And that's what a true disciple does. He follows and he doesn't stop. He doesn't let anything stop him from following Jesus. So whatever that is, that may come his way. And he even encourages the guy, look, let the dead, and he considers people who don't have a relationship with him, worldly people, dead people, spiritually dead. And he's talking spiritually here. Let the dead bury the dead. Look, if your father's dead... Then, then let those who are spiritually dead bury him. They'll take care of it, but you focus on me. You come and follow me, and you give me your all. You surrender everything to me. It's not a time of procrastinating. It's not a time to think about it. It is a time to follow now. And now is the day to follow more than ever before with what's going on in the world today. Everybody got freaked out last night because they saw a light in the sky. How many saw the light last night? Everybody. I even uh, Facebook Julian, you missed the rapture. And he didn't get it. He didn't realize that I was talking to him, that I missed it too. No, he did get that. But it, was, it turned out to be a missile. And they were practicing shooting down another missile from what I read. You know, uh, but it freaks people out. It freaks Christians out. I mean, I looked at him like, what is that? Some people started talking about aliens, you know, uh, meteor showers. And, you know, I heard uh, someone, oh, in the last days there will be meteors coming, you know. Uh, they're talking about a big one that's supposed to come. But it just brings this, this community of believers together in realization that, hey, we're in the kingdom of God here. And things are supposed to happen. And we need to be ready for those things, especially today more than ever before. Stop procrastinating and start following. What is discipleship? Let me give you my idea of discipleship. We have five minutes. I want you to understand, I have a specific idea. It may, it may be, um, I, I think it's true, but yet I understand the reason that, uh, that others go through, through discipleship courses and books and you know, uh, conferences and retreats and so forth. I understand all that. You know, there are a lot of churches that put a lot of effort and money into discipling you. Uh, they will take you to classes, and we do some of that. And, and you'll go through books, and you'll understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And there'll be conferences, and they'll ask you to read books on, on various topics and ministries and so forth because it's discipleship. It's pouring into you. It's equipping you because there's battles when you're involved with the ministry of God. And I totally understand that. Um, but I don't put my all my chickens in one basket, I guess you could say, as they say. Um, I have seen many people go through a lot of those classes, and yet they still aren't disciples of Jesus Christ. I remember a church, Willow Creek, <clears throat> who were bragging about growing so fast, and they were discipling people to be disciples of Christ, when in reality, when it was all over 20 years later, the guy writes a book and says, we didn't make disciples of Christ, we made Christians more worldly. We didn't do anything to bring them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So it doesn't always work. You're, you're getting some man's opinion. This is my opinion, by the way. You're getting some man's opinion telling you what it is to be a disciple of Christ. And you're getting his opinion and his experiences on being a disciple of Christ. Well, where did he get his? From another man, from another man. Here's my idea. Why don't you become disciples of Christ? 
Why don't you read his word and why don't you just follow him? Why don't you just take his word and be obedient to it and you will become followers of Jesus Christ? I think that is more important than listening to a man telling you how to follow him when you can listen to Jesus telling you how to follow him. I think it works. I think it's solid. I think it's a solid foundation. I know it's what I've done. I've never had anyone sit down with me and say, I'm going to disciple you. No, I discipled with Jesus Christ. I walked with him. When I read his Bible, I did what his Bible said. I tried to uh, obey him as best that I could. I made mistakes, but I, I continue to fight. I continue to battle, and I still make mistakes, but I'm still going to continue to battle and fight. I'm still going to love him, even if nobody loves me. I'm still going to do it because he is my Savior. He is my King. No one else is. And that's what God wants is a total commitment and surrender to him. We don't want people that are bookworms. We want people that are in love with Jesus and are his disciples because no matter what goes on around them they're not going to stop <clears throat> the nature of discipleship is the state of following Jesus Christ and serving and obeying him basically that's it that's the whole nature of discipleship following and serving Jesus Christ on a daily basis it doesn't stop it's not just Sunday mornings New Testament stresses is the privileges the joys and the cost of that calling. There are privileges and joys of it all. I love fellowship with believers. You know, we spent a couple of days at, at a retreat with 60 pastors and their wives. Man, we didn't want to leave. It's like, man, this is a, a, a taste of heaven. And we're here and we're focused morning to evening, worshiping, hearing the word of God, fellowshipping with like-minded people that understand our position, understands our concerns, been there, done that, you know, we're exchanging stories and about family, about children, and just, you know, all of this, and it's just like, wow, people who do understand us. I mean, it, it was just such a refreshing time, and there was joy in that. There was joy in that. There was peace there. It's a cost. The cost is the denial of self-interest, desires, a total commitment to do the will of God, even to the point of death, to denying your own desires and wants. That's discipleship. But that's not the United States. The demand for absolute liberty brings men to the depths of slavery. One commentator, Bonhoeffer, said, that's the cost of discipleship, to bring you to a point of slavery, to who? To Jesus. You become his slave. What's the benefits? Joy, peace, happiness result from following Jesus Christ together with the hope of being like him and with him in heaven. That's what it's all about. That's true discipleship. <clears throat> William Kelly was an outstanding student of the Bible whose scholarship and spirituality made him a real power for God's greatness in Britain. Kelly was, was once helping a young uh, man at Trinity College in Dublin uh, on his way to uh, becoming a great teacher. Uh, him, Kelly himself became a great professor. They urged him to take up the work at the college and thus distinguish himself. And when Kelly showed a complete lack of enthusiasm for their suggestion, they were confused. And one of them asked him, Mr. Kelly, aren't you interested in making a name for yourself in this world? To which Kelly replied, which world? Which world? There are so many ministers who are making a name for themselves. I'd rather make a name for myself in his kingdom, in his world, than in this world. True discipleship is about letting yourself go, getting out of the way, and letting God. And I shared this with you uh, about the summer fest, and we saw that video, and that's a perfect example of it. When that video is seen, you see nothing of Calvary Chapel. You, know, you see a blur here and there. You see some of the people that were serving there, and they were so precious as they were smiling and dancing and, and just having a good time serving the Lord there. But you didn't see me. You didn't see Roman. And I thought, perfect. And at first, I didn't think perfect, but at first I thought, wow, where are we? But that's true discipleship. Less of us, more of him. Because it was about showing his love his love out there and so our new model here in this church and you'll be hearing it more often is making his love known making his love known and that's what we did at the summer fest that's what we're going to do at thanksgiving 
We're going to make his love known. And we want to make his love known to this community. So when they stand before God, they have no excuse. <clears throat> his love was made known to them by Calvary Chapel Inlet. That's what we want to do here. See, true discipleship may even lead to death. All the apostles were martyrs in one form or another. I, I wouldn't want to go down the list, but I don't have time. Let me give you Jesus' idea of discipleship. Turn to Luke chapter 14, verse 25. <clears throat> now, let me say this before I, I, I read this because it's pretty radical. Understand, we live in America. Uh, we have lived in such a state of blessing that we don't necessarily have to endure some of the things that it costs disciples in other places like Africa, like Muslim nations. So we are living on the curtails, in a sense, of our forefathers who have laid a great foundation for us, and we are more than blessed. But this is Jesus' idea. A great multitude went to him, verse 25, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, his own life also cannot be my disciple. Really? Hate? I thought we were not supposed to hate. How about love less? If anyone comes to me and if they don't love their family less than me, they can't be my disciple. If they can't love this world less than me, they can't be my disciple. That's what he's saying there. He's not telling you to hate them because I love my family. I love my sons. I love my grandchildren. I love my relatives. I spent my whole life with them. Since I was a junior high and I met Virginia, I've known them all. I poured into them, played with them, laughed with them, drunk with them, got drunk with them. And now that I'm his disciple, I love them less because I love him more. Can't be his disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down, count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? At least after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who sees it begins to mock him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Oh, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able to with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off is sending a delegation and asking conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Jesus is saying surrendering it all to him is what true discipleship is. Now don't get me wrong. That's a radical life. And many live it to this day. But many can't. And I'm not saying you're not a Christian at all. I'm not saying you're not a believer. I'm not saying that you're not going to heaven. Because that's God's grace. See God, God, God has provided the way already. It's not our morality that gets us to heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's our morality that is evidence that we're going to heaven. Jesus provided the way. And so you accepting Jesus Christ as Savior is enough. But do you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you want to be on the front line? Then consider the cost to be on that front line. And when you're on that front line... I mean, there's no other place I'd rather be but on the front line, serving the Lord and seeing what He does. Because at that point, that's where you see the action and the work being done in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> we saw that yesterday, throwing up all that drywall, and these guys working together and putting it up. It, it was really neat. I love, even though I couldn't do as much, and I'd go in there once in a while, pick up a piece here and there, and be a part of it, you know? But it was just, it, it was right there. And why? for children of God, for his little precious children whom he loves so dearly so that we can have them in an environment they can sit and learn and be poured into that hopefully one day they will become preachers and ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why. That's building the kingdom.